Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases. Track your progress. Earn CME points. Visit mripro.io. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to another MRI Pro uh, webinar. Um, that was uh, a little taster of what MRI Pro actually is, but you can uh, have a look at that later on. Um, just to introduce myself, for those of you who uh, I don't know, my name's Jeremy Grummet. I'm an Associate Professor at Monash University and a urologist here in Melbourne. Um, and I'm thrilled to be joined by another stellar panel um, for the next hour. Um, to go through some cases together. So uh, once again, we are very lucky to have Professor Caroline Moore from U University College London. Caroline, thank you so much for joining us once again. Pleasure. Uh, we have uh, Caroline's colleague, Dr. Claire Allen, a radiologist also from UCL. Thank you, Claire, for joining us. My pleasure too, thank you. Um, and we once once again have Dr. Lisa Tarlington, who is uh, another radiologist uh, from Sydney uh, at the SAN in Sydney. And uh, Lisa's specialty really is uh, both MRI and PSMA PET and the combination of both. Um, so Lisa, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you for having me. And we have uh, the usual uh, stayers of uh, Associate Professor Richard O'Sullivan, our homegrown uh, radiologist and MRI expert here in Melbourne. Hi, Richard. Hello to everybody. Working at uh, Loomis Imaging. Um, and Dr. Andrew Ryan, who's an expert uropathologist uh, from Tissue Path, also here in Melbourne. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Thank you. So um, we do have... Uh, we want to stick to the hour tonight, so we're going to uh, get stuck into the uh, four cases. Um, so perhaps, Richard, uh, you might want to uh, start to get the MRI up on the first case. But while you're doing that, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Movember. Uh, it's timely, obviously, uh, this month to uh, thank Movember for their support of MRI Pro uh, over the years. Caroline, you're obviously very active with Movember. Uh, just remind, your, remind us your exact role with Movember now. Uh, so I do a, a couple of different things. I'm just going to have to show off my November oh, wow. tattoo on my, uh, on my arm. This, no, no, it's for this month only. <laughs> uh, so I chair the November Global Cancer Committee. I've just done a separate piece of work looking at active surveillance internationally. That should be coming out fairly soon. And there's a grant call out for that. And then I also work on the uh, real world data sets with uh, the True North, both in the UK and internationally. Fantastic. Um, and just a reminder also to uh, people tuning in that um, MRI Pro is now also accredited as a Monash University short course online. Um, so that's something to, that's uh, worth looking at as well. Final bit of housekeeping before we get stuck into the first case. Um, if you do want to uh, ask a question or uh, contribute or make a comment, please feel free to use the Q&A or the chat functions. Um, we may or may not be able to get to you because we do want to stick to time today. Um, but please uh, enter it in there if you want to. Okay, Richard, do you want to get the first MRI case up and I'll introduce the clinical setting. So remember that uh, tonight is all about uh, focal therapy in particular um, and the imaging, which is absolutely fundamental to uh, getting focal therapy right, um, particularly MRI, of course, um, as we'll be talking about, we'll, we'll also introduce a little bit of PSMA PET as well. So the first case is a pretty simple one. We'll start easy. Uh, this is a 73 year old man with a PSA of five uh, and a rectal examination uh, revealed a benign feeling prostate. He had no urinary symptoms, uh, but was not sexually active. So he went on to have an MRI after a all, all these patients have had uh, a couple of PSAs to ensure that they're uh, persistently elevated. Richard, would you like to show us what you're showing us? Okay, so we'll start with the sagittal T2, small volume prostate of a 20 cc. We can go from the base to the apex on the axial T2. It's a very subtle case, this diffuse decrease in intensity in the posterior peripheral zone. The only bit that's a little bit abnormal is this focal area here in the posterior lateral peripheral zone at the right apex. Uh, if we look at those two areas, if we look at that on the high B, that the diffusion wave imaging, we can see that there is subtle restricted diffusion at that site. 
dark on the ADC, bright on the high B value. And if you look here, this is subtracted images off the post contrast images. It focally enhances following contrast. And on the fused images, we can see here there's focal contrast enhancement. So I've called that a 0.4 centimeter pyrads 4 lesion without extra capsule extension. And, and I know that it was originally called a pyrads 4 lesion. Are you sticking with that, Richard? Or I mean, you said it was very faint. Very faint, um, yeah. I, I think uh, this is, to me, this is why the contrast is good. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. It does show a focal, focal enhancing lesion, which I think does tip you over in the peripheral zone from a three to a four, but it's a very subtle case, yes. Claire, any, any comments about what you've seen so far? Yeah, you may also see it quite well on the T2 coronal. Sometimes those lesions right at the apex there, you see quite well on those. But I agree with you about the GAD. Um, they often these little subtle focal lesions pick up very well on the gadolinium. Mm. Okay, um, so we'll move on to uh, the biopsy. Uh, so based on, on the strength of that MRI, this patient um, had a transperineal biopsy with both targeting and template uh, cores taken. Uh, Caroline, I know we've talked about this before, um, just while Andrew Ryan's getting the biopsy information up. Um, it, on that MRI, would your normal practice be to just perform targeted cores or would you also do some template or peri-target cores? No, so um, so uh, as Claire knows well, I obviously sample the target and then um, also sample the other peripheral zone, even if it's negative. And it's often the case that once we've decided to do a biopsy, we'll do a reasonably thorough biopsy. I don't routinely sample the transition zone unless there's anything um, noted by, by the radiologists, but otherwise I do like to sample both uh, peripheral zones because the non-visible three plus four will tip a decision for focal in a younger patient in particular. Uh, as in, if you did find it elsewhere, then you would avoid focal in that patient. Is that what you're saying? No, it's just that I would include it in the discussion. So for a yep. sort of a 75 year old, non-visible, mm -hmm. Three plus four doesn't make much difference for a 45 year old, it might. Gotcha. Yep. Andrew? Yeah, so there's disease uh, right anterior, right mid. These are all sub millimeter, um, three plus three. Then the real disease is right posterior and right apex, three plus four, 20%, up to four millimeters, just showing on the right hand side some of these more complex and, uh, and small cribriform glands. Mm -hmm. Great. So you can see from that that you know there's this really incidental disease elsewhere. It's really just the three plus four in the target that is is only sort of clinically significant disease. So this was one of our very first focal brachytherapy uh, patient cases that we did. We've been doing it for five or six years now, and um, so this was a very early one. Um, and uh, we've been um, following a pretty strict protocol um, even from the outset where every case that we did, this is low dose rate brachytherapy, um, we would follow up uh, afterwards with imaging and a biopsy. And the biopsy was focal and, sorry, targeted and template as well, just like the pre-treatment was, because we really wanted to get as much data as possible, I guess. Um, now, in the early days, uh, we were doing it at 12 months, which uh, most uh, or many uh, focal regimes would recommend. Um, and we'll come to why we changed that to a later date um, later on. But um, uh, so we delivered uh, 27 seeds um, of iodine 125 uh, via 12 needles into that area. Um, we do that with a five millimeter uh, safety margin. And, uh, and then 12 months later, in this case, we repeated the MRI uh, and the biopsy. Now, this patient, you might remember their PSA was five uh, pre-treatment, went down three months post-treatment to 2.8. Uh, this guy had no urinary symptoms pre-treatment or post-treatment, no bowel symptoms, and as I mentioned before, wasn't sexually active, um, and certainly no incontinence whatsoever. So, um, Richard, have you got uh, the post-treatment MRI? Because with insertion of brachytherapy seeds, it, it does give a fairly unique picture uh, which people who have done whole gland brachytherapy will probably be familiar with, but it's important to be able to interpret in focal. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, 12 month later MRI. Uh, the prostate volume actually has gone down a little bit from uh, 30 to 20, from 20 to, uh, so it stayed the same at 20 cc. If you look here on the axial T2 weight images, 
is two things you'll notice. There's most of the peripheral zone is darker than it was before and becomes more similar in appearance to the transition zone. These black lines are the brachytherapy seeds. Uh, uh, and uh, if we look at the, the uh, post contrast, this bilateral enhancement is unchanged. But if we look down to the apex, there's no enhancing lesion there. And if we look at the, uh, the subtracted images, this is one of the, one of the uh, uh, brachytherapy seeds here. The previous year had demonstrated focal enhancement is no longer there. I'll just go to the axial diffusion. And remember, this is quite a subtle case. So this is the high B I'm just going through now. So we do get an artifact. These bl black lines are quite more obvious on diffusion than they are on the T2s. The diffusion is more susceptible to metal. We can see that particularly on the ADC. And there's no, there's no focal area of restricted diffusion. So there's nothing left on the imaging. Would you say there's nothing left at all? Because it, it seems to me on the high B value there that there might be some. Yeah, but I think that's artifactual. You can see how, you can see how it's, it's a curvy linear appearance around and adjacent to all the metal. So I think that's mm. artifactual from the metal, obviously. Mm. So uh, I know that, you know, uh, there are all sorts of ways of doing focal therapy and you know, focal brachytherapy is probably not one of the commonest. We're going to have a look um, later on at, uh, some other modalities and what they look like um, after uh, focal therapy. So I'm looking forward to that. Claire's going to show us a couple of cases. Um, but let's just finish off this one. Andrew, um, are you able to show us? So we repeated a biopsy, even though the MRI was negative and the PSA was very low. This is what the biopsy looked like. Yeah, there's not much to see. A good number of cores from all those template sites as well as that target, that target site again. Um, what I've shown on the right here is essentially what we see. We see a dropout of glands, hyalinization of the stroma. The glands that are here, you get a, a decrease in the volume of the luminal cells and enhancement of the basal cells. That's, that's what we want to see. It can be very difficult uh, post-therapy uh, to interpret what those are. But this is classically what we love to see is that, is those, that atrophic kind of appearance. Yep. So, I mean, I've started with a pretty straightforward case and we're going to get a little bit more complicated as we go through. Um, just to finish off, this patient um, uh, at five years post-focal, PSA went down even further. So pre-treatment was 5.0, went down to 1.5, had mild urinary tract symptoms, was not on any medication for it. So a very successful sort of uh, scenario, but we'll, you know, it's important that we show the, you know, the wins um, as, as well, the losses as well as the wins. So we're going to have a look at some more complex cases. So Richard, are you happy to get up case two? Um, actually, just while you're doing that, there's a question from the audience, uh, which says, are these band-like or wedge-shaped lesions with no discrete DWI still fall into PIRADS4? Claire, are you able to answer that? Uh, are we talking about the post-treatment? No, pre, sorry. This is going back to pre. Okay. I'm 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 slightly at a disadvantage in that we're a unit that don't really use pirates. We use like it yes. more. Um yes. so uh I, I as I understand it with the Pyrad system, if if you have a, a diffusion lesion, then you will upgrade that to a to a Pyrads four. Um, certainly on the Likert scale, that would be a four as well, because it's got both dif a diffusion and a uh, an enhancing abnormality. So yes, it would be a Pyrads four and a Likert four. So the, the Pyrads two, I think they're referring to, is really radiating linear signal abnormality. It sort of radiates out from the centre of the gland. Whereas on that first patient, it was a linear area actually parallel to the capsule. So it doesn't correspond to a Pyrads two on the on the T twos either. And as, as you said, it upgrades on the diffusion. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, now, Lisa, I'm mindful of, of getting you in shortly. Um, Richard, are you happy to get the next lot of MRIs up while I give the clinical background? Sure. So case two, um, another uh, focal brachy case, 70-year-old uh, man. It's very similar uh, PSA, actually, uh, 5.1 this time. Again, rectal exam was benign. Mild urinary tract symptoms, no erectile dysfunction, uh, went on to have this MRI. Okay, so again, small volume prostate, 20 cc. Uh, and as we go from base to apex, uh, central zone here, transition zone here, there is a, there is a wedge-shaped area of decreasing intensity, but that does not correspond to a pyrad 3 distribution. It's a pyrad 4 lesion. Uh, 
if we go then to the diffusion, uh, you can see this, uh, so there is definite uh, a focal restricted diffusion with increasing intensity on high B value diffusion imaging, decreasing intensity on ADC. And we always do, we actually also do a sagittal uh, diffusion wave imaging, and it's even more obvious on the sagittal images here. There's focal con this is the subtracted images. There's focal contrast enhancement at that site, and the DCE uh, shows that focal contrast enhancement mm -hmm. on the left here as well. So I think that's also a pyrad spore lesion. Yep, clear. Uh, uh, no, I think um, that's been described beautifully. Yeah, pyratical. Yeah. Now, Claire, you, you were mentioning just a moment ago that, you know, you don't and haven't been using pyrads, but you're using the Likert score. And I know we've discussed this before, but I guess just for the current listeners, why have you chosen to do that? Um, because we did like it before pyrads even existed um, in our institution. So we've been doing scoring since about 2004, 2005. So it's a system that we've all grown up with or what we, we devised. The other thing which will become apparent, I think, later on is it's a system that you can use post-treatment. So as I'm sure everybody's aware, the PIRAD system is for the naive gland. It's for your sort of screening assessment of the prostate. And we really don't have, although there has been some literature on uh, post-therapy scoring, uh, you cannot use the PIRAD system, whereas the Likert system, you can just continue on. And for us as a focal um, centre, and we've been doing um, ablative treatments for, gosh, I can't remember, Caroline, must be at least 15, must be at least 15 years. It allowed us to continue using the same sort of system. So that's the reason that we mm -hmm. have continued, because we have such a variety of patients to switch between different scoring systems, I think would be exceptionally confusing um, for our clinicians. So that's what we do. Lisa, you've been reading MRIs, prostate MRIs for years. What mm. do you use, pyrids or like it? Or? Look, we use pyrids, but we don't use a, tr a true pyrids. We use uh, all the information that's given to us, but we use pyrids because that's what our referrers are familiar with, and um, it, it's it's the common language in Australia. So we stick to that. We use version two point one, and we we strictly adhere to that with a template report. Mm. And mm. so when you said, because I think this is really interesting about how people actually you know report <laughs> MRI on the, on the ground, right? Because yeah. the pyrids is like it. My understanding is that that like you just said, that people often will tweak the pyrads in, yeah. in a way that makes it more mm -hmm. clinically understandable right. and relevant to the, to the yes. clinician. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and we also use, you know, uh, all the information that's available to us, you know, what the DRE is, what the PSA, free to total. Um, you see, you know, sometimes if you're nervous, you see quite a few, I'd, I'd love to know how many 14 millimeter lesions <laughs> there are oh. around. Yeah. Just nerves, so people don't want to call it a pyrates five, and so things like that. You know, I think you can tweak pyrates a little bit um, in radiology. By you know, sometimes you you know the ADC value might be not quite as low as what you would like for it to be a pyrates three, but it looks qualitatively in your experience low, and the DWO looks bright, and despite the ADC value not being as low, calculated as low as what you think, you know, you, you might put more weight. Mm -hmm. on yeah I look I really think that's focally enhancing mm -hmm. you know disproportionate to the other side so you can tweak it a little bit to fit your your um I guess your experience and your certainty of, yeah. I think of, I th probably what you're seeing yeah I think the other thing is that Pyrad just undervalues the DCE obviously those of us have been doing prostates for a long time yes. we were actually doing prostates before diffusion existed so yeah. we grew up with T2 and DCE. So we were mm -hmm. so used to using yes. the DCE. And then, of course, diffusion came along. And, of course, that was hugely helpful. But we really, really liked our DCE. And it yeah. really downgraded the value of that. And DCE, I think, allows you to see tumours. And it also allows you to downgrade some of the diffusion yeah. areas. too. So yeah. um, I think we haven't got the balance on, the, on that yet. And hopefully Prime might answer mm -hmm. some of that. And, and sometimes, because, um, well, I think the DC actually really helps me appreciate and sometimes really allows me to upscore because I look at a lesion on the T2 
on the diffusion and it's 12 millimeters. And I look at the DCE and if you get a really good fat saturated mm. DCE now, you can see the capsular spread and yeah. you look back at your teacher and think, oh no, it's almost like a meningioma. You can see these sort of dural tails going around the yeah. capsule yeah. and you think, no, that's yeah. actually a lot bigger than what I first appreciated. So I think it does allow you to sometimes um, upgrade, get, having a better appreciation of size and particularly in the crater caudal extent when you get capsular spread and um, up and, you know, up and down the cap, you know, particularly the posterior capsule, um, but, you know, also anteriorly. And uh, no, I, I find it incredibly useful. Um, and, and, you know, those capsular tumors even have quite a little bit of a different vascular supply on a really good um, DC as well. They have capsular penetrating vessels and and um, they're an interesting bunch. And I think DC is very useful. And it becomes very easy, uh, very useful with focal. And Caroline, I want to talk about that a little bit, because if you look at the tumors, the DCE volume is usually the biggest. Now, when you're planning your focal treatment, it was interesting. You said you were using a five millimeter margin for your yep. brachy margin. And Caroline might want to talk about what we use for our margins. But these tumors are bigger than they look on MR. So if, if you're using DCE, you're actually almost getting the biggest extent that we can give you. Um, and then you add on to that to make sure that you're actually ablating these tumors fully. But Caroline might want to talk a little bit about. Yeah, go ahead, Caroline. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and we're very keen. We are um, we are running prime, which is to see whether or not you need contrast in the in the initial setting. But it's worth noting that the contrast is the most poorly done sequence, even in precision. It was the worst of the sequences. And that was across a lot of centers uh, that you had to be quality controlled and assessed to get in. In terms of and in terms of surveillance, you can progress on any of the three sequences, which is really interesting. So we always like to have all the sequences. And then specifically for focal, completely agree with Claire. We want to, we know from the work where we did a transrectal biopsy and a hemiablation, and then compared it to men who'd had a real intense mapping biopsy and a focal treatment, side effects are, are actually less in the second group. So you can do more ablation and get less mm. side effects. Mm. And therefore, I don't worry side effects wise, the side effects come from treating out to the capsule and beyond, which we do, but treating with more of a medial margin into the gland doesn't tend to give you more side effects unless you go across the urethra. And margin wise, I tend to aim for five to nine millimeters, depending on the grade, depending on the patient age and depending on where it is. Obviously, I don't apply that uniformly, so I don't just treat right across the sphincter if it's right next to the sphincter, but that's the kind of thing I have in mind and not worrying that it causes more side effects unless you're, you know, um, uh, changing what you're, what you're treating into. Mm. I, I think this is a fascinating conversation, which is, you know, so applicable to focal therapy in terms of, especially with regard to the DCE. I think that's a real nugget. Mm. Um, goal there i mean and all, all of the panelists are obviously very pro dce um regardless so it's interesting in the you know given that you know and we're involved in the prime study as well richard's slaving away um doing double reads of the of the mris <laughs> with biopharmetric as well um uh, but you know there's obviously a pragmatic push towards the biopharmetric um but in the focal space in particular in addition to the di general diagnostic um dce might really um have additional value so um anyway we'll get back to the case just one other thing if you look at um the small lesions you see only on psa pet that you don't see on mr if you go back and look at the color it usually enhances uh, and so i will i as a result of that if I, if the gland is completely normal on t2 and d and dwi and i see a focal round enhancing lesion i will call that a parad 3 to make you biopsy it because I think that it may well be a high-grade lesion. And is that um, is that more so in the peripheral, obviously in the peripheral <laughs> zone that that that, you, or even in the transition zone, you apply that rule? Much harder, I think, uh, Lisa, in the, in the transition zone. But yeah. yes, peripheral zone for sure. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Andrew, have you got the, the biopsy on this one? Two. So that's that target area on the left-hand side. Three plus four, ten percent. Uh, multiple cores up to seven millimeters. Again, just giving a representative of the closely packed, um, well-formed glands and then some more complex glands in the middle there. Mm -hmm. 
So again, on the strength of that, we did focal low dose rate brachytherapy. Um, now being posterior, I, I forgot to mention this with the first case, what we've also been doing is um, instilling some hydrogel. Uh, mm. So we've been using space or just only for the posterior lesions. Uh, I don't think there's any value in doing it for the anterior ones, but, but we are using radiation. So um, we found that to be uh, pretty useful. So three months post-treatment, uh, the patient did have some mild lower unit effect symptoms, um, did have some mild erectile dysfunction, was using Tadalafil um, for that, but it's still achieving intercourse. The PSA dropped from 5.1 down to 1.4. Um, again, we did a 12 months post-treatment uh, MRI and biopsy. So Richard, if you could show us that. And then the, the biopsy um, is a little bit more interesting as well. Okay, so this is the uh, 12 months later. Uh, and if we just go to the axial T2s, you can see again this more homogeneous looking uh, transit uh, peripheral zone. And here are the seeds uh, just on the left hand side. Uh, and if we look at the uh, oops, diffusion weighted images, uh, the, the previous uh, area that was demonstrated. Uh, Restricted diffusion, it's really just obscured by this metal artifact from the, from the seeds uh, on the ADC and also on the IB value. There's no obvious restricted diffusion. Uh, this uh, picture is the uh, subtracted images of the DCE. This lesion no longer enhances. And if you look at the uh, fused images, uh, also this lesion no longer enhances. You can see the seeds here. Mm. Okay. Um, just while we're looking at the DCE there, Richard, um, there's a question from the audience. What's the, <clears throat> excuse my voice, there's a, what's the current temporal resolution you're using in DCE? Um, I, always, <laughs> I always forget the answer to this question uh, because we have changed it a little bit as a result of Prime. And right. I can't really go quicker or slower, but it's about one every three seconds, isn't it, Claire? Is that right? No, so we, we uh, it's between twelve to fourteen seconds. So what we've done is we put the we we've made the sequences longer in order to get better spatial resolution. Um, we we don't feel because we're not doing a quantitative analysis on the DCE, we prefer to have a visually um, recognizable image um, rather than one that needs to go into a program. So, uh, and that actually fits in with Pyrides version 2.1 as well. So we, we, we recommend anywhere between 12 to 14 seconds. No, but we actually changed our protocol a little bit. We went from, we went from a higher temporal resolution to a higher yeah. resolution as well as prime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so what I might do is just quickly um, get the biopsy result up from Andrew. And then, Claire, I'd love to have a look at uh, your cases because we've just seen what, we've seen a couple of cases now, what focal brachytherapy looks like in the post-treatment uh, imaging setting. And if you've got a bit of IRE or HIFU to show us, um, we'll look at that in just a moment perhaps. But Andrew, this is an interesting uh, biopsy result. It is and it'll segue beautifully into your 12 to 18 month kind of transition and not getting in too early. Uh, so there's definitely tumour still in the target. Um, in contrast to the previous one, we can see these voluminous closely packed glands. We get these small atrophic glands. Um, now, you can see from the report that you know, we, traditionally we don't grade prostate cancer in this setting where you've got architectural distortion and, and disturbance based on the therapy just makes it too hard. My colleague has given it a grade here. I think it's probably demonstrates the risk of giving a grade. I think most of these are individual glands. I wouldn't have called it 4-3. I think I would have called it 3-4. There are some complex glands here, but I think it's probably a treatment effect. And, and I can't tell you, and I think we've discussed this at the time, I can't tell you whether it's on its way to death or whether or not it's survived and and will become something bigger and better afterwards so um and i'll be interested in others comments on this so we've looked hard at this um because it's obviously important for this particular modality and so we did push it out to 18 months um whether that's going to make a material difference or not we, we, we're yet to see because of course you can still have radiation effect even even years afterwards on a, on a biopsy but there was one study that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering in 2019, which I found really interesting, where they looked at the long-term oncological outcomes of patients who were having radiotherapy and had uh, post-treatment biopsies. And they were either benign 
or they showed severe treatment effect or they were clearly cancer. And they found that uh, obviously the ones that were clearly cancer had poorer outcomes, but the benign and the ones that showed severe treatment effect had identical oncological outcomes. So it's, you know, it's not proof by any means, but there's some circumstantial evidence to suggest that perhaps if we're seeing a significant treatment effect that we're at least on the right track. But Claire, are you happy to... Um, yeah, uh, no, I am. I've, 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 obviously, as I said, I've got an electroporation case and I've also got mm. a high food. So I'll just run through and just stop me whenever, uh, yeah. whenever you wish. And Caroline, um, absolutely uh, uh, dive in because obviously these are these are your cases. So the first case I'm going to show you is an electroporation case. Um, and I'm just going to get that up for you. And OK, so this is a... Um, a PSA 10, um, 83 cc gland. And um, we can see the tumor is really anterior. So I'm just going to get you onto the right bit. So we've got um, a long B in the middle, we've got a, a DCE on this side, and we've just got the axial T2, and I'm not gonna show you any of the other sequences. This was the tumor sitting here, and it's quite an unusual transition zone tumor, um, but was picked up um, and was biopsy confirmed as Gleason 3 plus four, up to about 10 millimeters, and it was about 20% pattern four. Um, and um, Claire, these, can I just interrupt for a second? Because you know, yeah. these to you know to the let's say the urologist in the audience. I mean, that to me, when I look at that, it looks so similar to other parts of the transition zone. How did you call it a positive? Um, so we called it because it's. We called it because obviously the T2 is the dominant sequence in the transition zone. Mm -hmm. This was rather this was rather lower T2 signal than the rest of the transition zone. It was also homogeneous and it wasn't conforming to a nodule. And it was just slightly in an unusual place. Um, and I think it is difficult sometimes with the conspicuity of some of these transition zone lesions. And we've sort of learned to look at odd patterns and it is a bit of pattern recognition I have to mm. say so this area here was tumor and you can see that that actually does focally enhance but this was also tumor here um, and Caroline might want to comment on now on that there was no other tumor to see biopsy confirmed what sort of modalities we might use to treat that yeah absolutely so we um we used to, in the smaller gland, use HIFU anteriorly, but the outcomes are, you have twice the failure rate. So we, we never use HIFU for that sort of tumor these days. Mm. So my preference on this one would be the nano knife electroporation, four needles in, short treatment can be really the kind of accurate. We also have a cryotherapy program. And for, for larger things, and potentially for that one, he, he could also have been considered for cryotherapy. Okay. So makes sense. So had um, nano, and I'm just going to show you. So uh, we do do a significant margin um, on these tumors. This tumor sat against the capsule, as you can see, between about 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So about, a, as Caroline said, about a five to nine millimeter um, uh, treatment uh, zone is, is what we would want. Claire. And of course, this is what DCE shows us particularly well. Sorry, Jeremy. Oh, just a quick one. How long after the treatment are you doing the imaging? So again, there's no real standard and there are lots of ablators who don't believe you need to do an early um, post-treatment scan. I think our feeling at UCH, and also particularly because we train a lot of people, is if you don't image your early ablation, you won't know what you do and you won't know why you fail. And my second case um, shows why you fail. Um, and so we do this anything up to about a week to 10 days. If you get longer than that, so this is a dynamic, dynamically enhanced, and we also do a T1 fat saturated as a Tebus Bineco as well to get a really good um, resolution scan. Yeah. Um, and it allows you to see the zone of necrosis. If you leave it longer than that, you start to get granulation tissue coming in from the outside of the um, necrosis, and you end up with a double rim of enhancement. And not only do you do you have a smaller treatment volume that you're that you're visualizing, but you get a whole pile of inflammatory change, and you're not quite sure 
what it is that you're looking at. So we like quite an early, you can really start at about 48 hours afterwards and you can go up to about a week. Um, and it's just a straightforward enhanced. The T2 here shows why you can't use the T2 because the actual T2 itself, although you can see that something has happened to this prostate, mm. um, you cannot see where the ablation is and nor can you see the quality of it. This is a very typical T2 appearance for nano in that we get this bright rim, um, which we don't see on any of the other ablative modalities, which is almost like a sort of an edematous shock effect um, mm. from the apoptosis that you get with the, with the nano. And then you get this heterogeneous T2 signal actually within the um, zone of treatment itself. And one of the things that you can you can do when you're looking at the the ablation zone is you can see how necrotic, if you like, it is. We're looking for we're looking for complete confluent necrosis. Sometimes we get patches of enhancement within the ablative zone, and then we know that the ablation has not been complete. And we are much keener at looking at those patients a bit earlier to see whether they have recurred. Because we are producing a lot of necrotic tissue, we would not um, sample this for at least a year when mm. the necrosis has all resolved. And indeed, Caroline might want to talk about what um, would normally make us rebiopsy, but we wouldn't routinely rebiopsy any of these patients unless there was a specific reason, which I can show you on some of these. So the other thing. To Sorry. So the other thing to note, obviously, is quite a lot of the ablation has continued on into the uh, uh, levator and obviously into the obturator muscle here. This really doesn't matter. This is clinically irrelevant um, and heals very easily. OK, and, and, and I'd love to hear Caroline's um, yeah. uh, perspective on, on biopsy. But um, were you when you first started doing uh, ablative and IRA and so on, were, were you doing biopsies just, you know, 12 months just to confirm that what you thought you were seeing on MRI was was actually correct yeah so we've done we've done a lot of that and we do that in the trial setting so each of our modalities we start with a very sort of um well-defined trial in, in different patient groups um you know including index for high few over 600 men across multiple centers and they all have had a one year and a three-year biopsy and then once it moves into um regular practice so in the uk we can do that using um as long as men are submitted to the registry so we we have um great registries for the for the focal therapy we don't routinely do biopsies so we do a biopsy essentially if we're worried so if the mri suggests recurrence absolutely we do a biopsy and then we i might also do a biopsy if the psa is rising and the mr isn't giving us a clear reason why Sometimes there's been a kind of growth spurt on the MR and the whole prostate's grown, you know, significantly since the last MR, so that's fine. But if it is that the um, PSA is rising, then, then and the, you know, the urine's clear of infection and we don't see anything specific, then I might do a biopsy in that case. But it, it's not that often. Most of the biopsies I do after focal would be because of a, an area of suspicion. That isn't always positive, maybe 50%, because some of my colleagues would say, well, actually, we just go back in and retreat. But I'm quite keen to have a biopsy, one, to be sure whether or not they need a treatment. And two, if there is a grade upgrade, then I want to give them the option of radical treatment as well. OK, so so biopsies aside, just going back to the imaging post treatment, Claire, you, you're talking about doing one, say, one to two weeks post, but then you're doing another MRI at one year. Is that right? Yes, that, that would be our that would be our routine so, unless, unless there was some clinical concern or need mm -hmm. to do one earlier. The problem is, is that um, even at six months, some of the necrosis may not have fully resorbed. So you will then be scanning an area that isn't yep. that is still a bit inflamed. So really, we would do our next scan at one year unless there was a, a, a problem. Yeah. So I've got a, a question from the audience. Um, John Yaxley's in uh, is tuning in and um, from Brisbane. He's a urologist who does a lot of uh, IRE focal therapy, and he's wondering how often would you find a change between the early post treatment MRI and the twelve month MRI? In other words, is it is it necessary to do that early MRI? I suppose if there's if there if, if barely any patients are changing. 
so, so there's a huge change oh, yeah. <laughs> there. i'm sorry isn't that uh so the scans look really different you can absolutely see whether it's the you know and i don't know if you've got his uh his latest latest scan but this is um, the one year yeah that's uh, up now yeah so they look totally different and you get very different information so there it's much you know the, that ablation zone has really reduced as it does and so they look very different the reason i like to do the one week is that if I've had a really good one week MR, you know, really good coverage, covered the margins that I want to, and then I get recurrent disease, I'm much less likely to go in for a second time because I think for whatever reason, the modality was delivered well, took up the energy well, and it's come back anyway. If for whatever reason, the one week MR is suboptimal, and you know say it's a challenging apical tumor and it doesn't look well covered then i'd be more likely to go back in with the same technology if the patient wanted it because i think that's a technical miss for whatever reason i think you know i or whoever's done it we can get a better hit this time i'd be prepared to do that so i find the one week mr is really helpful from that aspect interesting okay and uh, lisa it looks like we've got a special guest panelist join us <laughs> Fantastic. Just a reminder, uh, although it might be early morning over in UK and, and Europe, it's a quarter to 10 here in, uh, on the east coast of Australia. So you're on mute, Lisa. That's all right. All right. Claire, did you want to carry on with that? Yeah, so this is the this was the one year, and in fact, the four year looked absolutely identical, so that you can see that you have uh, volume loss, and you often get quite significant volume loss with these uh, ablative technologies that produce necrosis. Um, you get a T2 low signal post treatment fibrosis. So T2 is not a good um, a modality to or scan to use for looking for recurrence. And what you're looking for is the same signal that you saw in the original tumor. So here's the long B, and there's absolutely no abnormal signal there. And again, the DCE, you can see that that area of fibrosis is not producing any DCE signal at all. And this was stable, and I've got a four year scan, which for the interest of time, I won't show you, but it was absolutely identical with no mm. evidence of any um, recurrent uh, residual or recurrent tumour um, uh, in that area of gland. And this is a nice anterior sort of, uh, you know, TZ tumour. Um, I presume, Caroline, this patient had next to no side effects or minimal? Yeah, yeah. minimal. Well, about the same as a biopsy for him. Yeah. You can get more side effects with nano, particularly if you're doing something across the midline. Um, that can be more problematic. But yeah, he was fine. Mm, terrific. Um, Claire, did you want to um, uh, put up the Haifu case in, as a comparison? Yep. So this is the Haifu case. Um, so he's got a PSA of 4.8. He's got a left basal lesion, um, which you can see here, um, a discrete lesion, uh, which was beautiful for um, ablation. It was not adjacent to any of the critical structures, such as the sphincter. Um, we do sometimes treat into SVs, but this was separate from the SV. Um, and it was Gleason 3 plus 4, 20% pattern 4 um, on biopsy, PSA 4.8. Okay. So this is, again, a posterior lesion. Um, and Caroline, do you want to talk about HIFU and posterior lesions? Yeah, so HIFU is really our, our workforce for, well, for focal therapy altogether because posterior lesions make up the majority of lesions. So um, really suitable, very typical case for us, three plus four, 20% pattern four, uh, visible on MR, that's the sort of sweet spot for focal therapy. We do do focal outside of those indications, and in particular, we do four plus threes as well. But this would be our commonest, I think about 70% of our registry is three plus four. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you uh, avoiding, are you doing any three plus threes? No, I can't. I can't think of a case that I've done. We do know that visible three plus three from our MR surveillance data has about the same progression rates as non-visible three plus four, but mm. it's rare for me to do either. I do occasionally do a non-visible three plus four for you know for particular reasons, but not that not that often. So what you're describing is almost identical to to our study protocol. We're we're very much homing in on the on the grade group twos and threes, um, all all three plus fours, but um, we've got an upper limit of four plus three of of ten millimeters in a core. Sort of think that that's the as you say the sweet spot for focal. 
Yeah, and I do, people sometimes ask me about the volume limit. And I, I sort of do take volume into consideration, but we don't have a sort of defined limit. But yeah, I think if you're getting over over 10 mils of four plus three, that's quite chunky. And, you know, I'd be yeah. less likely to do that as well. Yep. So, so this yeah. was the this was the initial post-treatment scan done within a week. And you can, again, see on the T2 how you can't see where the treatment was. You know something's happened. I would also say that this degree of edema within the soft tissues of the pelvis looks alarming, but is absolutely normal. And we see after most of the ablative treatments within the uh, of the prostate. And some people get very alarmed and talk about trying to drain some of this. But this goes very well the patient's not symptomatic and it and it does just settle down with uh, just uh, doing absolutely nothing so this was um the ablation and this was the uh, dynamic gad sequence and you can see that the ablation's not quite as good as the one that we've just looked at and that's why i chose this um and although it looks like and we can actually see where this lesion was um on the t2 um and you can see that we would have preferred for there to have been more capsular treatment at that point it's a little bit patchy um, not quite so confluent um, and complete um, as we saw previously so we're a little bit of a question mark about the quality of the ablation treatment um, mm. in this case um, but at uh, we continued and because the PSA was falling nicely from 4.8 to 1.3 we um, left um, left the patient for a year um, and we did a year follow up, which is this one. Um, and I'm just going to show you the T2. And this is an absolutely typical appearance of a prostate post a, a posterior ablation, such as HIFU. So you get volume loss, you get T2 low signal fibrosis, and you also get these cavities that form. And we think they form because you have ablated partly into the prostatic urethra. And these are usually confluent with the prostatic urethra and contain urine. Um, and they can be a little bit of a challenge sometimes um, after if you go and do PSMA on these patients because they end up with a high focus of PSMA. And if the person reading the PSMA isn't looking at the prostate MR and realizing there is a cavity there, we had initially some reports of, you know, uh, active tumor within the prostate, which was just in fact this uh, urine um, in in, in, in these cavities. Um, and I'll just show you the, um, but when we looked at the other sequences, we couldn't find any evidence um, of any tumor. So what we look for when we're looking for recurrence is we knew that this tumor enhanced and we knew that there was also restriction. We will offer, often see small areas of enhancement first before we actually get a diffusion lesion. And one of the major ways that we follow these patients is using interval imaging like we would for anything else that we're looking at, you know, renal tumors, lung tumors, you follow patients with interval scanning. Um, and we've got quite good at that and quite good at um, working out whether things are changing. So the first change would be um, a, a gadolinium and then followed usually by a diffusion lesion. So this patient didn't have any lesions at that stage. We felt that that had been um, completely ablated, but uh, briefly, I'll just show you what happened five years later. Mm. So he started to have a slight rise in his PSA. Mm. Um, and this is what his prostate looked like five years later. So it took a little while. Um, and again, we do find um, that patients tend to, uh, Caroline might address this, both in-field and out-of-field recurrence. So we always look at where the ablation was because they are likely to recur at the site of the ablation, but obviously they may have an unstable gland elsewhere. So you always need to make sure that you haven't missed a lesion elsewhere. And I think you can see now that we've got a focal area of enhancement that we didn't have before. There's a little area of high signal on the long B and really the T2 is non-contributory at this stage. And that was resampled and it was again recurrent three plus four. And he actually had a further ablation. Mm, interesting. Caroline, did you want to come in? Yeah, so about one in five men over a five-year period have a second ablation. About one in 15 go on to have surgery or radiotherapy. Generally, the recurrences like this one are in the same area as the original tumour. So, and we're happy to, and we was happy to ablate twice in the same area 
Um, you know, we saw a sign of something on the one week MR. I'm happy to go back in and, and he's doing fine. We're also happy to ablate the other side, but I do take into account the fact that ablation can make radical prostatectomy more difficult. So I'll be really wary of treating on both the right and the left if they might be looking at a radical in the future. So if they're pretty young. It doesn't seem to make much difference side effect wise to radiotherapy. So, you know, may, may be a consideration. And most people who are eligible for a second focal, we get them to see the surgeons for discussion of radical prostatectomy and radiotherapy, but mostly they opt for a second focal if they're sort of allowed, as it were. Yeah. So I'd just like to pick up on that point because I think a lot of people who are new to focal therapy, one of the bit or, or people who aren't even practicing it, are worried about burning bridges. And um, I'd love to hear what, what your experience, Caroline, is in, um, uh, I mean, we've literally had uh, one patient so far who's had to go on to a salvage um, and we've done around about a hundred uh, altogether, but I'm sure you've done, you've, you've done hundreds and hundreds. Um, uh, and therefore you'll have a percentage, as you just mentioned, that have had salvage radicals. In terms yeah. of IRE, HIFU, which, which is what you're using, what sort of experience are the people who are doing those operations having in terms of uh, the salvageability? Is it is it problematic? Yeah. So I I mean, what I say say to patients is that it is more challenging. So you need somebody who is sort of keen on that challenge. So uh, we do a lot of work with. Um, um, Paul Cathcart, who has a particular sort of specialist interest in this area, and obviously our own team of surgeons at UCLH, uh, see we've got the biggest focal therapy program, therefore they've got the biggest salvage after focal. I think it really makes a difference how much you've treated and where it was. So I think early experience when we started out with whole gland, salvage after whole gland is much more challenging than yeah. salvage after focal. Yeah. And I think if it's an apical tumor, I think that makes it more challenging than if it's a basal tumor and you've got, you know, some, some ablation at, at the basal end. So I think it's really important that the people who are doing it want to are sort of um, accepting of focal therapy as a concept. That's not true throughout the UK. So to go to somebody who tells the patient off for having focal, it has been known entirely unhelpful I never tell anybody off for having radiotherapy although I do you know salvage after radiotherapy you know of course um and then also the technical skills so in fact Paul Cathcart's series are, are they called um what was it called raft radical after focal therapy his functional outcomes for those men were better than the national average for primary treatment so wow. it really makes a difference so yeah. so interesting um, and a question from the audience uh, in relation not to salvage radical treatment, but you talked about second ablations. Um, the question is, do you use the same or a different modality than the first? Yeah. So the commonest situation is a HIFU and then a second HIFU because it's a posterior lesion. So I don't use nano or cryo for posterior lesions. Salvage after radiotherapy, I've got, we've got a photodynamic therapy study. So, you know, that, that's an option. Um, if there's a new anterior tumor and we've successfully treated a posterior tumor, then certainly open to a discussion of, you know, depending on other factors, depending on age, would they ever want surgery, that sort of thing. Um, we can, we have used different modalities, but the commonest is a HIFU and a second HIFU. Okay. Um, and I'd like to just move, and, and perhaps Lisa, you can help um, answer this question. Just, <clears throat> I know Lisa, you haven't necessarily got loads of experience with focal per se, but you've got a huge amount of experience comparing MRI and PSMA PET. Now, obviously PSMA PET is generally speaking used for staging, mm. but more and more evidence is coming out to show how good it can be looking at the primary tumour within the prostate. So yes. as you've been looking at these pre and post images in various modalities, um, with your experience in PSMA PET, what, what role might you say PSMA PET uh, could have in, in this focal space? Yeah, so um, I think there's, if you divide it up, I can see that there's probably two, two main roles. Um, so prior to focal therapy, I mean, we know from the primary study that um, PET done with MRI, and that was an algorithmic fusion. Um, it wasn't even a cognitive side-by-side -side fusion. The readers were blinded. and um, 
it wasn't a software fusion or a contemporaneous acquisition, a simultaneous acquisition with a PMRI scanner. And we know that then the negative pre predictive value went up to 91%. So I guess if you know you've got one lesion, um, PET with MRI, I think would be a good study to rule out uh, MRI occult lesions elsewhere within the gland. So I think um, it could help better select an appropriate candidate for, for focal therapy. Um, and as we discussed earlier, like with the DCE, I think, you know, often when I don't, when I'm reading a, a MRI prostate now for primary detection, I think, well, where would a PET pick up tumor extent that people would usually miss on MRI? And so mm. not always, like it's, it, you know, sometimes we don't have vascular tumors, but I found that PET with MRI helps me appreciate capsular extent. So I really do look at the DC, not to just upgrade a peripheral zone lesion from a three to a four, but to really look at extent. So I think that, uh, but mm -hmm. not all tumors are vasculars, but PSMA PET certainly, I think helps define the extent of disease and particularly capsular extent. And um, I guess that's one thing that you were talking about. Um, patients get more symptoms with focal therapy with posterior capsular involvement. And um, so I think to a assess for a suitable candidate, perhaps with a bit more specificity and and also to look at tumor extent. Um, I think also for follow-up, um, a lot of those, the enhancement and the issues that might cause, um, I guess that are helpful though on the early MRI, but um, could potentially with the less experienced hands cause um, potentially false positives. I think that the PET could help add specificity there, but as you mentioned, um, Claire, that you had had those uh, PSMA um, filled or, or, or ligand filled <laughs> crevices that have been falsely interpreted as positive for tumor. And um, whilst we haven't done focal therapy, we've certainly seen a similar but less pronounced phenomenon post TERP, where we don't always see a um, T2 perceptible crevice, but we do see little cracks on on uh, on PET. And when you go back and you fuse it with the MRI, certainly there's no tumor there. In fact, the T2 signal. Um, in that whole sort of segment or, or zone, maybe slightly higher, and you look on the CT and it's lower density, and you can tell that that area of the peripheral zone is actually urine logged, water logged, um, yeah. and you only need a few drops of of trace to spill into that area, and it looks like you've got a tumor there, and you really don't. And you know, I've tried doing CT IVPs and rolling the patients around, and you need a reasonable amount of excreted um, contrast to try and mimic that. You just can't. Um, you only need a couple of drops of of Radio pharmaceutical to cause a false positive. And so mm. PET will also have mm. its downfalls. And I think, you know, using what they call non renally excreted ligands, they're not completely non renally excreted. And certainly 107, you know, wasn't wasn't the, um, you know, it, it wasn't as useful as we thought it would be, not only with obviously false positives in bone, but there are certain percent of patients that did still have renal excretion. But I think follow up will be useful, particularly as we get start to get second generation minimally renally excreted agents. Um, and I guess on, on the flip side, you know, preferably it'd be nice to have a PSMA positive tumor in the beginning to be able to follow up. Um, but we certainly know that tumors, um, and, and often it appears the larger they are, are heterogeneous. And certainly we've seen PSMA expressing metastases in what we thought were cold primary tumors. And, you know, under the microscope that these things are very heterogeneous beasts and you might get one or two cells that are PSMA expressing and that's all you need. So if even if you have a non-PSMA expressing primary tumor, it doesn't mean that PSMA PET would not be good for follow-up um, and vice versa. So, you know, it's something that I would really, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, um, mm -hmm. but I think together with MRI, I don't think you can replace mm -hmm. one. I think you'll see what the primary study showed is that together, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, the, the, that's right. Yeah. Um, Lisa, thank you for those comments. I'm very mindful of time because um, we finished our, our one hour. Uh, I think it's been a fantastic and, and fascinating discussion about, you know, the role of imaging, uh, MRI in particular, but obviously touching on PSMA PET as well in focal therapy, because of course focal is just 100% uh, dependent on, you know, superb uh, optimal imaging. So it goes together very well. Um, so um, I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists for giving their time today and educating all of us. We've had a fantastic turnout. Thank you to all the attendees, but in particular, uh, Professor Caroline Moore, Dr. Claire Allen, Dr. Lisa Tarleton, Associate Professor Richard O'Sullivan, Dr. Andrew Ryan, 
thank you all, all for um, giving up uh, your one hour of, of today, uh, but of course also your decades of expertise uh, that you're sharing with everyone who's online. So we have recorded the session, as, as we mentioned, we'll post it on the website later on so that if you have, if, you, if uh, you, you couldn't see the whole thing or if you want a colleague to have a look, they can, um, they can catch up with it then. So thanks once again, and um, we will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.